Now we're going to talk about how matter is made out of particles that are vibrating, zipping around, bouncing off of each other. This statistical behavior of atoms and molecules actually leads to large-scale behavior. So there are only a few formulas you need to know. The ideal gas law will be familiar to many people from chemistry. PV equals nRT. Well, in physics class, we're writing it slightly differently. Uh, in the original form, n, small n, is the number of moles, and big R is the universal gas constant, which has different units. One of them is 8.31 joules per mole kelvin, etc. Well, in the physics version, we use big N, the actual number of particles, so it's gigantic. Remember, Avogadro's number is about 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd, so we're talking about trillions of trillions. Kb is Boltzmann's constant. Boltzmann's constant is another way of expressing the gas constant, really, because small n times big R equals big N times Boltzmann's constant. So you could think of it as the gas constant, except for counting particles instead of counting moles. So really, it's the same formula as before. Angle brackets stand for average. So when I put angle brackets around K, I'm talking about the average kinetic energy. 1 half mv squared average equals 1 half m vrms squared. You can solve for the root mean square velocity. It turns out that the average kinetic energy of a particle, which is moving in three dimensions, a three is for three dimensions, is 3 halves kbt. Kb is Boltzmann's constant. T is the absolute temperature in kelvins. Random motion of particles. We want to try to describe that. So let's start with an unrealistic but simple example. Suppose you had a particle that could move back and forth on a line. And it takes a step of one millimeter and does it every millisecond. If it goes in a straight line, it would cover a meter in a second. But it's not. Instead, it's randomly choosing whether to go left or right, which means it's going to spend, on average, as many steps going to the left as going to the right, and it's not going to get anywhere. Its average position would be zero. We don't actually want to know average position. We want to know, on average, how far will the particle wander from where it started? How far will it diffuse? It turns out the diffusion coefficient, capital D, can be described as delta squared over 2 tau, for technical reasons. Uh, and in this example, that would work out to be 5 times 10 to the negative 4 meters squared per second. That's the diffusion coefficient. After some math, some statistics behind the curtain, we find that the average distance traveled, what we call the root mean square distance, is the square root of 2 times the diffusion coefficient times the time times the number of dimensions. So I said one dimension, I chose the diffusion coefficient to be that, and I put in a few times. In one second, this particle could have gone one meter, but it only managed to go about three centimeters, because most of its motion cancels itself out. If we wait longer, if we wait 10 seconds, it turns out it'll only go 10 centimeters. If we wait 100 seconds, it will have only gone about 32 centimeters. It's diminishing returns. The farther you have to go, the less likely it is you're going to get there in any reasonable time. So if you're calculating a problem and you get a ridiculously long time, uh, years or centuries or something, for a particle to diffuse a meter, that might actually be the correct answer. Uh, sometimes diffusion, regular diffusion, is just incredibly slow. It makes sense on the scale of a cell it doesn't make sense on the scale of a human body. This first model of what we call a random walk uh, is pretty unrealistic. Particles are not going to do specifically that. Can we get a more realistic model? Well, it turns out that we have Einstein to thank for a formula that is diffusion coefficient times drag coefficient is Boltzmann's constant times the temperature in Kelvins. All right, what's the drag coefficient? Well, if you have a drag force, which is proportional to the velocity, the coefficient of the velocity is the drag coefficient. So this is the diffusion coefficient, and this is the drag coefficient. Kb, Boltzmann's constant. 
the blooper reel for this is ridiculous. Okay. A more accurate model uses this equation by Einstein that relates the diffusion coefficient and the drag coefficient to Boltzmann's constant and the absolute temperature in kelvins. Diffusion coefficient is this thing. If you have a drag force that is proportional to the velocity, then F is the drag coefficient. In the case of Stokes' law, when a sphere is moving slowly through a fluid, uh, we get 6 pi times the radius times the viscosity times the velocity is the amount of the drag force. Finally, let's talk about Fick's law of diffusion, his two laws. They talk about how the concentration of a substance changes with location and with time. In other words, if you start out with a bunch of particles in one place, how do they spread out? You know that if you give it a long time, it'll spread out evenly because diffusion is random. But how does it get there? Which way will substances diffuse if you have what's called a concentration gradient? And how fast will it go? That's what Fick's first and second laws are about. So to describe this, we need to talk about concentration, which is the particles per volume, just like density is mass per volume. We also need flux, which is how many particles are passing through an area per time. So it's particles per area per time. And Fick's first law is saying how quickly particles will travel, how much flux you will get, depends on how steep the concentration gradient is. Okay, what's a concentration gradient? Well, if you had something that was already thoroughly mixed, its concentration everywhere would basically look like that. It'd just be uniformly mixed. But suppose you started out by putting a lot of ink, say, in the top of a glass of water, and you were watching it spread slowly downward. Now, if the left edge represents the top, we could say we started out with a big concentration of ink, and over here is the bottom of the glass. Over time, this is going to change. It's going to spread out, spread out some more, spread out some more, and eventually become uniform. We're going to try and describe that process. Fick's second law is harder to describe. Uh, it has to do with the curvature of the concentration versus time graph. You won't have to compute anything, but you may have to draw a picture. Uh, what it effectively says is the more sharply curved this is, the faster it's going to even out. If it's too low, it'll move up. If it's too high, it'll move down. Um, places where it's gently curved will do it more slowly. Places where it's steeply curved, sharply curved, I should say, it will happen more quickly. Here's an example. Suppose we just have something that is concentrated in the middle and tapers off towards the end. This has a negative curvature. That means that this amount here is going to drop over time. Over here, the particle amounts are going to go up, and eventually it's going to even out like that. Let's look at this one. Uh, we know that eventually things are going to even out, but what's going to happen in the meantime? The places that have a sharp positive curvature are going to rapidly move up. The places with a gentle curvature are going to slowly move. So you'll get, a after a short time, you'll get that. Then things are gentler, and it will take longer to move closer and closer towards the eventual equilibrium. Ultimately, what we're describing is everything's always going to go flat in the end if you allow it to. Uh, they talk in biology about a cell setting up a concentration gradient. Uh, it has to spend energy, spend ATP, in order to maintain that. Because if you just let diffusion happen, the amount's going to even out, and you're not going to have a gradient anymore. You're going to have the same amount uh, at one end as at the other. But living cells require concentration gradients. They need a lot of an ion outside the cell and a little of it on the inside, or vice versa. That's how nerve cells work. That's how our sodium-potassium pump works.
Uh, it's how many biological systems work. Here on the left are two images of Fick's first law. If you have a steep concentration gradient, you have a lot of concentration at one end and very little at the other, you're going to have a fast flow of particles, which is a high flux. And that's because you have a steep gradient. That line is steep. Uh, the lower case is what if there's a gentler gradient, a shallow gradient, there's not a whole lot of difference in concentration, so you're actually going to have a slow flow, a low amount of flux. On the right, here's an image describing Fick's second law in action. If you have a really steep curve, like that peak on the left, it's going to change really rapidly. So you see its height you know, just cut in half really dramatically, at going from the black curve to the red one. And the gentler bumps had much less extreme changes. Um, and then if you wait even more time, you'll see that the rate of fall of the big sharp peak has slowed down because it's not as sharp anymore. The sharper the curve, the faster it's going to change towards equilibrium. That's essentially what Fick's second law says. Anything curving upward has positive curvature. Anything curving downward, like a frown, has negative curvature. And the sharper the turn, the faster it will shift towards equilibrium.